So today I'm going to talk about data visualization, focusing really on um, simple graphs with just with not too many data points, trying to bring out some basic principles of data visualization um, that we could talk about this for a whole semester. And there is a, a great course in the, in the CS department about data visualization that I would recommend to you. Um, I, I'm also happy to point you to um, books and other resources at the end. Keith. Uh, do you know of any like Coursera or Udemy or LinkedIn courses that you'd recommend? I don't offhand. I will. I will. Um, I'll take a look afterwards, and I'll. I'll let you know if I find anything that seems good. Okay, because I found some on Code Academy, but um, I didn't know if there were any that were a little bit more scientific and data science related. Because most of them I found are just like super general. Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure, but I I will look into it for you. Thank you. So. Um, my my focus is is primarily on on data visualization for data science um, for science and sort of the key principles in displaying data well are to be accurate and clear to really let the data speak we're trying to show as much information as we can um, recognizing that if you that um, when you have a lot of data to display, showing all of it can really kind of obscure the the message that you might have. Um, and that the focus here is really on science rather than sales. And so we want to avoid any kind of unnecessary frills, especially gratuitous three-dimensional rendering. Um, and I'll I'll show you some examples immediately. In in tables in particular, every Every digit that you show in a table should be meaningful. You you want to um, not. I mean, you want to round appropriately to where the the information lies, and you don't want to drop ending zeros because they can often um, be the the ending zeros can can get, be in, informative about the significant figures. So. Um, as a first example, this is a, a plot just showing a treatment group and a control group with eight measurements in each group. On the left, I would say is a, a call it that a, a good example um, where we're showing all of the data, including also showing um, the the mean in each group and some some measure of uncertainty. Of that around that mean was that a common um, rendering of this sort of data in a in a scientific publication just shows the mean and the the uncertainty in that mean so when you have um, 50 or fewer data points per group um, it's best to show the actual data rather than just show the mean and the and you know the confidence interval. These sort of bar plots with antennas sticking up are um, a particular pet peeve of mine. Um, one way you could make the plot on the right even worse would be um, to you know eliminate the, the measure of uncertainty so that you're just showing two numbers. Um, you could also make it worse by rendering it in 3D. Um, it sort of default in Excel as a 3D bar chart. Bar chart. The, the 3D bars are projected in front of the axis in the back. And so, you know, in the picture at the right, you are only showing two numbers and it's hard to tell what the two numbers are because you have to really sort of project back from the bar to um, you know to to where the axis is because that's you know set behind where the bars are so I mean that 
sort of key first principle in data visualization is show as much information as possible. Don't show so much that you can't see the message, you can't see the difference in the treatment groups, but this sort of ubiquitous three-dimensional bar charts, um, you know, is showing very little information and making it hard to see that information at all. Of course, in, in Excel, you can do lots of fanciness, like you could render those those bar charts as pyramids, you know, pyramids in color. Um, hard to see a useful application of this. And you may say that, you know, this, <laughs> this plot on the right, like you would, no one would ever do. But in fact, I've, I've seen it in practice in a, a poster. I think it had something to do with like, um, vaccine rates or needle exchange program or something where it was felt like those pyramids kind of represented a needle sort of shape and was used for that reason but really hard to see how this this would ever be of, of value to anyone and you know excel gives you some great innovations in terms of the bad visualization of data if you can look at these from above um, so you're only showing two numbers and you can't tell what those two numbers are. When you have a small number of data points per group, it's best to show the actual data. And, you know, you, you, you could do so while also showing the averages in the two groups and your measure of uncertainty like a confidence interval. So principle number one, show the data. The second principle is avoid pie charts. Um, pie, pie charts, so th this, is, this is some old data on like browser usages. A prob the main problem with pie charts um, is that humans are notoriously bad at measuring or comparing areas and so most pie charts you'll find you people will include the actual data themselves as numbers as you know labels on the on the slices and that seems to me kind of an admission of failure that your if you have to show the actual numbers it's indicating that no one can actually measure the relative sizes of these things Pie charts have one advantage, which is it, it demonstrates that the numbers that you're showing add up to 100%. And that, you know, is a worthwhile um, thing, but it has the disadvantage that no one can really, um, no one is really good at gauging the size of these slices, which is arguably what you're trying to do in a visualization of this sort. So. I'm not enthusiastic about bar charts, but in this case, the, the bar chart that shows the relative sizes of the slices as you know heights of bars um, is much more effective in actually showing the relative sizes of the numbers, which I mean the, the only disadvantage of the bar chart, I would say, is that it's not obvious that the numbers add up to 100%, but it has the advantage that you can actually you know, gauge the relative sizes of the slices um, much more readily. And, you know, pie charts in three dimensions, which, because this was particularly popular like in the late 90s when this was a, a new thing and to be able to have the computer show these sort of three-dimensional pie charts. But the, it makes it even harder to tell the relative sizes of these slices because you now have to like imagine um, that you've distorted the sizes by this tilting. Blowing it apart um, you know, makes it even, well, I mean, it doesn't really make any difference, but it, it, it I, I would say, you know, the picture at the right looks nicer, but it is not effective in what we're actually trying to accomplish, which is, uh, you know, showing the relative sizes of these um, browser usages. 
And just to emphasize this again, um, you know, these two pie charts, you can you distinguish the sizes of the, the five slices? Do the pie charts look any different between each other? Do the sizes of the slices, um, are they all the same? Or do they vary in some way? You know, making this in 3D really makes it harder to tell. I mean, now you would, you'd kind of think, you know, look sort of like A is smaller than D, but, but, you know, because it, it's really hard to tell. But if you do this as, as bar charts instead of pie charts, it's immediately obvious the relative heights of these, you know, the, the, dis, the differences among the five slices. And the you know the key point of this sort of visualization should be for people to understand you know as a, a visual rendering of these five numbers and if the visual rendering is such that um, you know you just can't tell what the relative sizes are because humans are just terrible at measuring the relative sizes of at comparing areas then you know Hopefully, I've demonstrated to you that pie charts um, are general are not a good thing. You want to avoid pie charts. So the this the special case of a pie chart with two slices, I would I would not bar you from using it, um, but personally, I would prefer a bar chart with. Um, or what you might call a, a you know, a, if a stacked bar with with two different um, components, I view that to be better than a, a you know a two color pie chart, just because humans are better at measuring the relative heights of bars than they are at measuring the relative um, sizes of of slice areas. So an, another key principle in data visualization is really to just always consider that you might want to transform by taking logs. You know, the picture on the left, um, here, here again I have a treatment and a control group with a small number of measurements in each group, but maybe 10. Um, the, the responses I'm getting vary over many orders of magnitude. You know, this could be like, gene expression or some serum measurement like cytokines. The, it, you know, not taking logs and plotting these on the original response scale, the, the plot ends up being completely um, dominated by these two large points. And I don't have any ability to distinguish among, you know, to, to really to see the variability in the lower end of the scale. So when whenever you have values that are over many, many orders of magnitude, you almost always want to take logs. You know, taking the picture on the right and, and just showing the average in each group or just showing the average in each group but in 3D, um, you know, this is really a kind of criminal mis um, distortion, well, not criminal. This is a distortion of the information that's that's going on there. Is the, the average is totally dominated by the two large numbers in the control group. And it, it's really giving you a, a not, you know, a, the, what you're seeing in this in this plot is nothing like what the data are actually showing. Another, here's another case of where you want to take logs. This is um, gene expression measurements for two replicates of the same gene expression microarray. So the, here I'm showing it on the original scale and the, it's sort of obscured, it was obscured by the, the horizon, I mean the, the 45 degree line. But um, in plotting, the gene expression values on the original scale, it's the the plot is dominated almost entirely by the, the really large values. In fact, um, 
50% of the data is below this pink line and 90, 99% of the data is below this blue line. So we're really only seeing, you know, less than 1% of the data by showing these gene expression values on the original scale. If instead I took logs um, and I, I'm a strong proponent of log base two, that we see much more of the data by taking logs. That a, a second key, um, a, an additional important principle here is, so in this plot, we're looking for, are there differences between replicate one and replicate two of this microarray? We're looking for points that are sort of off the diagonal. So everyone looking at this plot needs to rotate their head to the left 45 degrees so that you can then kind of line up this, your eyes with pink line and look for points that are off the diagonal here. Um, if, you know, in cases like this where you're interested in the differences, it's much better to, to plot the differences directly. So when, whenever you're interested in differences between two things, I would I recommend to you that you plot those differences rather than um, plot the two replicates against each other. So this is sometimes called an MA plot. Not really sure where the M and an A come from, but any in any case, on the y-axis, I'm plotting the difference between the two values on the log scale, or equivalent, I'm plotting the the log of the ratio. And on the x-axis, I'm plotting the average of the two log values. Um, so here now, we're, you know, in, in trying to look for points that are showing a different response between two replicate microarrays, you know, like this one and like this one, now we can relieve everyone's, relieve the pressure on everyone's neck by not making them not making the, the reader or viewer rotate their head 45 degrees. You can just look at it vertically and say what points are above or below the horizontal line. I think you, I mean, you also notice here that, that um, you're making more complete use of the space of the diagram. By, plot, by taking logs and by taking differences and plotting those differences, you get you, I mean, you're you're using more of the 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 area. It's a more efficient use of space. And the reason that I prefer log base two is that then you know you know plus one and minus one is you know twice as big or half as big. Um, log base two has the advantage that they the the nut that the numbers come out more close together than if you're looking at 10, 100, 1,000. And we're just as good really at measuring um, at you know, multiples of two, you know, two, you know, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. It's pretty easy to figure out what the original, what these values are on the original scale. when and they're, they're closer together. So I really like log base too. So the principle so far, show as much data as you can. Show the data itself. Um, don't just show the averages. Um, secondly, don't use pie charts, um, or at least avoid using pie charts. Third, take logs. And fourth, if you're interested in differences, calculate those differences directly and plot the differences. I've shown this picture before, but this is another, like, I wish I had taken logs example. So on the, this is a plot from one of my, f the first papers I've published more than 20 years ago. Um, on the y-axis is a ratio. So um, it's a ratio of female to male genetic distance. So the, the values from one to zero are the cases where the male value is bigger than the female value. And the values from one to infinity are cases where the female value was bigger than the male value. So the, the problem with this figure is that it really overemphasizes the cases where the ratio is bigger than one. 
because the, the values where the ratio is bigger than one is stretched from one to infinity, and the values where the ratio is less than one are sandwiched between one and zero. If I had taken logs instead, I would have given more balance to the, the ratios above one and the ratios below one. And I think really almost, almost always when you're plotting ratios, you should be plotting log ratios. You should be plotting ratios on the log scale. So an, another key principle is to focus on what you're trying to compare in a plot um, and to put the things that you want to compare adjacent to each other. So these are two different um, versions of a figure where I have females and males in three different genotypes. And I'm looking at some, like the average response or the average trait value it, in th for three different genotypes split by males and females. So in the figure on the left, um, I'm putting females and males next to each other. So what, what's most easy to see, well, I mean, this would be the way to do it if, if you were really interested in the sex differences. If you're interested in how males and females differ, you know, within each of the genotype groups, this would be the, the, the way to show it. On the, on the right panel, I've put the genotypes next to each other. So I have the three genotypes for the females and the three genotypes for the males. So if I, if I were most interested in the genotype differences, then this figure on the right would be better. The kind of a, a key point here is that the appropriate figure to make, the appropriate data visualization, depends somewhat on what you're trying to say, on what, you know, it, it depends on a, a really a value statement about what comparisons are most important. Um, if you're most important in differences between genotypes, then the figure on the right, which puts them next to each other, would be the best thing. If you're most important, if you're most interested in the sex differences, then the figure on the left is a better thing to show. T to ease comparisons, um, coloring the, the values can also be useful. Um, you know, to say, make all the female values one color and all the male values another color, it would, um, you know, maybe help to draw out those um, groups. Um, and the, the choice of colors can be important. I've, I'm showing here pink for females and blue for males, which is, in a sense, reinforcing a common stereotype. And I think we should ask ourselves, is, you know, is that a good idea? I mean, the, using pink for females and blue for males, it has the advantage that, you know, most of us, you know, are aware of that stereotype. And so we see the pink and we can kind of easily, you know, it, remember, that encoding I did of color for for sex. Um, on the other hand, I think that choice is probably not something I want to reinforce. It's probably better to. Um, it, it would probably be better to choose a different set of colors. Um, I, you could say orange for female and purple for male, something like that. Um, you know, the choosing pink and blue has the advantage that you can um, make use of a, this common stereotype to help people to know which encode, I mean, to remember the encoding of colors and sex, but it's probably not worth it um, reinforcing that stereotype that, and, and better to make a different choice of colors here. I don't know, what do you all think? Y useful to use the pink and blue or best to avoid it?
I could take a poll. Interesting. So, I mean, so the, I mean, the, the result is three yeses use pink and blue for female and male, one no, and two non-responses. Um, one of the, one of the non-responses was me. So, um, I, I think in, you know, it, it mean, it, whether you use pink and blue for female and male, depends somewhat on the context, but I've, I've been leaning now towards choosing some colors like say green and purple that um, that uh, you know avoid this stereotype. It, it, you know in thinking about this this point of the you know the value of um, trying to ease comparisons. I want to th think about what, kind, what, what, what sorts of comparisons are easiest to, to make. You know, so if I'm trying to compare the values A and B in a bar chart where they're right next to each other, in a bar chart where they're you know, separated somewhat, you know, in stacked bars where they happen to be the lowest in the stack, in stacked bars where they're really, you know, s you know, separated from each other like this, in stacked bars where they're sort of on top of each other, or within a pie chart, I think it's it, 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 there's been research on what you know, you know, typical human viewer is able to. So you can't hear me. Or you can hear me. I got a question that my audio is cut out. Well, hopefully it's still showing up in the recording. Um, so, sorry for your audio troubles. Well, I was trying to say that, um, the, I mean, the, the research, research on this sort of point corresponds reasonably well to um, what you'd expect sort of by introspection, that comparing heights, you're really comparing the position of the, the top of the bar is easier to do when they're next to each other than when they're farther apart and you know easier to do when they're longer rather than being squashed within um, a stacked bar chart that you know making comparisons of you know two links that are separated from each other is harder to do than make the comparisons of the you know the top of the bars as here um, and that comparing areas is it, or or maybe the the angle of the slice is maybe the is the hardest thing to to do. And I mean, sort of an, another key principle is to not distort the quantities themselves. Um, I saw this pic saw this picture in a, a talk it was really emphasizing the size and complexity of the wheat genome versus the, the human genome. Now, the human genome is 
3 billion base pairs long. Um, the wheat genome is considerably larger than that. It's 17 billion base pairs. Um, so, you know, about, a you know, a bit more than, well, it's five to six times bigger. Um, in comparison, the Arabidopsis, which is a, a model plant, um, its genome is, is you know, 0.15 billion base pairs, or, you know, 145 million base pairs. It's about 20 times smaller than the human genome. In this figure, um, they're using the, the radius of these circles to represent the size of the, of the genome, to represent these numbers. But when you look at the figure, because they're circles, you immediately, I think, view this. You, I mean, what, what you're thinking about in comparing the size of this wheat genome circle, which is so big, it doesn't even fit on the slide. Um, you're really looking at the area of the circle and not the radius. So if you're going to um, represent the size of circles for numbers, you really need to focus on the area, the area and not the radius because the, the viewer is going to view the area. You know, if, if we change the figure so that the area is proportional to the values, you, you know, the, the size of the wheat genome is still a lot bigger than the size of the human genome, but it's not that much bigger. You know, supposedly we can fit five or six of these, you know, pink circles within this larger sort of wheat colored circle. And I guess, you know, if I did this right, we could fit about 20 of these green circles inside this um, pink circle. Um, if you're if you're going to show circles to represent, you know, the size of circles to represent your numbers, you need to recognize that the viewer is going to be focused on the area, and so you really need to make it the area that that corresponds to your value and not the diameter or the radius, because if you make it the diameter or the radius, you get a figure like this, which really completely distorts the information. But even I think in this figure, I mean, you can, you know, it, it is, it's really hard for us to, to gauge the size of these circles, I think. Um, you can see that this one is bigger than this, but how much bigger? I mean, you pretty much have to have the numbers there before you can tell, I think. So I think a, a better, representation of these data would be this bar chart. I admit that the bar chart is a really boring depiction of the data, but it, it just, it does a bunch better job in allowing us to understand the size of these numbers. You know, that this, that I could fit about five of these high or five or six of these high to get to the height of the wheat one. And that, you know, the green versus the pink, that this is about, you know, the hum the pink one is about 20 times bigger than the green one. So in heights of bars is a, if a, will make, is an easier way for us to, to view the numbers than the, than the sizes of circles. Even though, I admit that this picture is with the circles is much nicer to look at and really th this picture really hammers home the differences it does so in a way that distorts it this is probably you know I mean if it's like your first slide on a talk about how complicated the wheat genome how big the wheat genome is I think maybe this would be the better depiction but if you really want people to know what the numbers are, then you're you're left with this you know really boring bar chart as the the scientific choice, I think. But, you know, data visualization is about taking data and encoding it by 
features of the of the of a graph for for quantitative values you you have a variety of different ways of trying to encode those those quantities you can use position as in you know the heights of bars you can or you know length you know the length of bars angles or areas as in a pie chart or that circle chart um, you can use sort of how you know light or dark something is by you know a grayscale for a quantity or you know some kind of color scale for a quantity but the, and these um, methods of encoding the data as um, in graphical objects in a data visualization sort of of decreasing um, quality in terms of like getting the numbers back, sort of reversing the encoding. For categories of things, you know, like sexes or countries or, you know, that sort of categorical data, you can use shapes or hue, like different colors. You can use texture, like, you know, like cross hatching in a, as, as you might have done in the, you know, in the 80s. Um, or the you know the widths of lines or or points. And these again are sort of decreasing ability to really to easily distinguish the categories. Um, if you're if you're trying to dis, if you have a complicated figure where you're trying to show multiple things and enable multiple different comparisons, and some of the comparisons are going to be based on, um, in, or some quantities will be will be encoded in position or length and other quantities you might have to resort to shapes or colors um, and that so the 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 choices you make there de will depend on i mean the really a value statement about which comparisons are most important um, to your message or to what you know what you perceive the the readers um, you know what comparisons are most important to the reader. Another point in trying to ease comparisons is that you, you want to, as much as possible, align axes. So th um, this figure is kind of a made up histograms that's showing the distributions of heights of women and of men. Um, and I have the men shown here twice, once where I've aligned them vertically so that, you know, so the axes are aligned, which makes it easy then to compare the relative, the, I mean, to compare these distributions that, you know, there's sort of a shift to the right for men versus women. Whereas um, in the two histograms next to each other, um, you, because the axes aren't aligned, it, to make a comparison between this histogram for men and that histogram for women, you have to sort of look at what the average is here around 64, say, and bring it over here and see how they compare. That the average here is around, you know, 68. Um, so this is maybe the distribution of heights of men in 1910 or something, where where I was a, a normal person rather than a, a, a and then rather than being short. Um, my point here is that um, you, if you want people to be, if you want your reader to be able to compare these two distributions, then you should arrange them such that the 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 axes are aligned. Um, put them one on top of each other so the axes line up rather than side to side, where in order to make a comparison between these two histograms, you really have to sort of bring the, the, you know, the scale and position of this histogram into your mind and then imagine it back over there. And an, another really um, key technique is just using common axes. So in the, the two figures on the left, I'm letting the, the range of the data determine the, the axis scale for men and for women. 
So the, the axes here on the left are, are different for the two distributions. With the axes on the right, uh, or the histograms on the right, I forced it so that um, they have the same range, every, the 70s, 65s, 60s, that, that the axes line up perfectly. And again, the, you know, the histograms on the right are easy to compare directly from this, from because I've aligned the axes and I've forced them to have the same axis limits. There's the figures on the left. In order to make a comparison, I really have to bring, you know, the location and and I have to bring this into my brain and then sort of imagine it back out here. And I can't use the visualization to make that direct comparison. So another important technique is to put labels directly on your plot rather than using legends. So the, the legend over here, um, so I have, I have three different groups of points and the shown as three different colors and the, the colors are indicated by this legend. Whereas in the figure over here, the, the labels on the three groups are plotted directly on the graph. And the figure on the right does a much, it makes it much easier for the reader to see what the three groups are. Because the figure on, figure on the left, you pretty much have to kind of memorize the labels before you can um, figure out which, to, to, to figure out the groups. The legend on the left would be somewhat improved if I made the order of the, the legend to more closely match the order of the groups in the plot. I think if I had to use a legend of that kind, I would have put blue on the bottom and pink on the top because that would of course bonds more closely to the way the groups appear in the data. So the group, the sometimes you see, sometimes you see even, you know, even worse than this would be to not have a legend on the plot, but to have the, the the have the the color labels just described in the caption of the figure. Um, as much as possible, it's best to you know show the legend in the plot like this. And but even better is to put the the labels directly on the plots next to the groups. The figure on the right is a lot more work to create. Um, for the most part, you have to like. Um, well, I mean, there are some tools, for example, in R, it's a package called Direct Label that helps you to, to have these labels show up directly in the, in the plot. Um, but for the most part, you kind of have to hand code this. Um, for a figure in a talk or in a paper, I think it's worthwhile doing, going to that extra effort of getting those labels directly on the groups in the figure. Um, for for a more um, informal report, I might not take the time to do that. Um, I might just resort to this um, figure legend. But as much as possible, putting direct labels onto the groups um, makes it easier for the reader to, to um, recognize that sort of color and coding you've created. Another really important principle is don't sort alphabetically. Essentially, never sort alphabetically. If you have a bunch of different groups, you should sort, I mean, like countries here. So this is healthcare spending probably in like 1990. Um, healthcare spending as a percent of GDP for different countries. Um, much better to show it sorted by the the value than to sort by the the country's name. The sort alphabetically has the advantage of being able to you know identify where a country is. So like if you want to find China, you can you can look down to find China and see the point here. But it has that's the only advantage. If you were interested, say in um, 
are there region, you know, sort of continent or otherwise region specific effects here? It's much easier to to look at these sorted by healthcare spending by GDP. You can see that the United States and a bunch of countries in Europe show up all at the top. Um, you can see that effect here. Identifying that effect in this figure where they're sorted alphabetically is would be really hard to pick off. I like this sort of plot a lot as kind of a, um, a visual depiction of a table. Um, and I really recommend it to you, you know, over um, plotting a table, I mean, or displaying data as a table where you just have list of countries and show the, and show their values as numbers. I think this visual depiction has a lot of advantages, but, um, and, and you could pack, I mean, basically it takes up about as much room as a table would be. You could pack a bunch of columns of, of data, um, like this same sort of close to the same area that you would put a table. So whenever you're thinking of a table, maybe think of making this kind of plot instead. Um, you notice that I put horizontal lines at every fifth value to help help to pick out what are the points in between. Um, kind of a useful guidance. Probably the most common question about data visualization is, should you include zero in the y-axis or not? Um, in, the, in the picture on the left, I'm showing so this is some sort of detection rate, like of a kind of assay. And I, I've rendered them as bars. Um, and that, so the axis goes from zero to 100 percent. Well, zero to 120 percent, actually. The figure at the right shows the same information, but I'm rather than showing them as bars, I'm showing them as these little like um, confidence interval. So Star Wars fighters um, plot. I think if you're going to show bars as in the figure on the left, then you must include zero. You can't have bars that start anywhere other than zero. But in this case where we're trying to distinguish values that are close to 100%, I think there's, it's better to not use bars, but it's just use you know line segments at the values and focus on you know the, the upper, range from 95 to 100% rather than go all the way down to zero. If you use bars, you must include zero. But in in this case, it would be better it's better to focus on the top end of the range because we're not really interested in detection rates that are near zero. We're interested in detection rates that are near 100%. And this plot on the right does a much better job of allowing us to make the comparisons between these three methods um, versus the, the bar chart over here. I would also point out that, you know, if you have a detection rate that's constrained to be zero, between zero and 100%, that it's, an, a, you know, a, another flaw in this figure on the left is having the detection rate y-axis go beyond 100%. That seems to me um, kind of a no-no to have the axis go outside of the range that's really allowable for the variable that you're plotting. Um, that's not, I mean, I won't hold it against you. I would just, me, I would prefer to keep the y-axis limits constrained to be where the value, where the data can are actually allowed to sit. But, whether to include zero as part of the y-axis depends somewhat on the um, the audience of the picture. You know, it, it could, I think, if you're talking to scientists and you're talking about a detection rate, then leaving off the, 
zero and just sitting on the top end of the range, it's not really distorting the information. It's making it easier from the, for them to make the comparisons they want. On the other hand, there are, there are other cases where I think focusing on just a narrow part of the range can, you know, for certain audiences really kind of distort the amount of differences, distort those differences, um, overemphasize differences that are really not that important. So there's, there's not really a s universal answer to this question of must, must you include zero or not. Um, if you use bars, you must include zero because bars can't be starting at any value other than zero. If you're not using bars, then you don't need to include zero and you often will want to focus on a more narrow part of the range to better distinguish among the differences you're looking for. Um, this is an example of a bad table. T tables are, are um, rem rem you know, have a lot of uses. When you really care about the data themselves, um, you, you want to know the individual values, and it's good to show a table. But this particular table is taken from the journal, a paper in the Journal of the American Statistical Association, which is like the flagship journal in statistics. Um, at least the flagship journal for the main American, uh, the U.S. Statistics Society. This table has the, the uh, you know, the first main flaw is that there are just way too many digits here. Um, it, there's almost no case where we really can measure things to this many digits. Um, showing five digits past the decimal point when you have values that are going from 22 to 69 it's like almost surely um a, a waste of 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 um space also the having the the periods not be aligned is a a, a, a real we, aligning the aligning the decimal points is it is really helpful for making comparisons among the values that you're showing. But here, um, you know, they've dropped ending zeros probably because it, you know, of, of Microsoft Excel, which tends to drop ending zeros on, on numbers. You know, if, if we care about 26333, three, three, then this should really be 0 0.20000. Um, dropping the ending zeros is, is a, a real, it, is bad. Um, this this is this is sort of my version of how this table should be shown. Um, I've thrown out two thirds of the numbers, and I'm, so I'm showing two digits for this first column. Really, just showing two digits for each column. It gives you the same understanding of how much variation there is in this outcome with values of n. Um, yeah, and by by discarding two thirds of the numbers in the table, it really making it easier to make the comparisons of of what's left. Statisticians aren't unique um, in in making bad tables. This is a table from the the Lancet um, that's showing. Um, showing mortality rates in in different age groups in different years. Um, there, there's so much wrong with this table. The, you know, if, we, if blowing up, a, you know, one part of the table, you can see that, you know, these are confidence intervals that are to, you know, 145.32 to 174.98. You know, when you have a confidence interval that's that wide, 145 to 174, then you shouldn't be providing the the um, the endpoints to such precision. It's just not necessary. Um, that 
you, you should you can use the the range of the confidence interval as a to help you to help guide you and how precisely you want to show them and really we have just way too many digits being shown and also you know not lining up the decimal point is a is a problem i guess they line up the decimal point on these on these values here but they they didn't do they should also do so in the confidence interval that looking back at the full table the main problem here is that the things that we're really trying to compare probably are incidents at different years. How much has incidents changed over time? How much has the prevalence changed over time? And whatever it is that we're looking at here, which I've already forgotten. Um, and the, the things that, are, that we're most trying to compare are like this 159 to this 167 to this 168. Or it could be comparing the rate in the under 75 group to the rate in the over 75 group. The, these comparisons we're trying to make, the key comparisons are put really far apart. Um, and many of them are this sort of horizontal. The, you really want to rearrange this table so that the things that you most want to compare are right next to each other. So put the incidence values next to each other and ideally line them up line up the things that you want to compare, like the three years, line them up vertically rather than horizontally so that you can make the comparisons more easily. Um, epidemiologists, you know, like statisticians, like to make really big, complicated tables. This one, it just has way too many digits. The numbers aren't aligned. The numbers that you really want to compare aren't anywhere near each other. and I don't know if you've noticed, but comparisons in tables are much easier to make when they're vertical, moving up and down, rather than horizontal. So the, the most interesting comparisons you should really try to align vertically. Um, but in any case, I, I think that table would be much better as a multi-panel figure. You would have a much more, I mean, it would provide you a, much better insight into what's going on if it was a figure rather than a table. And one last example, um, this is from a, a blog quite a number of years ago in the, a, po a blog post in the 538 um, website. Um, so this is looking at, at um, sort of rates of collisions driving collisions um, by, by cause in different states. And I'm showing here three of the plots that were shown in that, three out of, I think, five plots. The, the three plots were really arranged vertically in a really long web page, a blog post. Um, so you can't make this sort of direct comparison between the figures in, they, you weren't able to make it in that blog post. Um, you notice that the, the, the states are shown alphabetically, which really makes it then harder to learn about the, the nature of what's going on and learn about regional differences. You want, um, now, so they're, they're sort of comparing here overall collisions in a state to the collisions, um, that are due to speeding, the collisions that are due to, um, alcohol-related collisions. Um, it's really hard to learn much at all from this this figure. So what I what I would do instead would be to show. So this shows all five, all six of the outcomes that they had shown, um, in one figure. I've sorted the 50 states, not by, not alphabetically, but by the total number of crashes, um, sort of per billion driving miles. Um, and then for each of the other five outcomes, I've plotted the values um, using that same sort. So this then really points out, um, two outliers that were not as easy to see in the original figure are, are really easy to see here. Among non-distracted driving, 
um, crashes due to non-distracted diving. Mississippi is especially low, and Wisconsin is especially low, given the amount of total crashes per billion miles driven for those states. Um, the otherwise, you can see that kind of the this sort of increasing value in non-distracted driving corresponds reasonably closely to the increase in total crashes. It's saying that the non-distracted driving rates kind of, you know, are correlated with the overall number of crashes, kind of correlated with alcohol-related crashes pretty well. You also, I think, see in this, in this speeding column that they're kind of like two groups of states, sort of a lower level of speeding-related crashes and a higher level of speeding-related crashes for a given amount of total crashes by state. So you know, the, these things, those features were present in the original figures, but really hard to see because of the sorting by um, alphabetically rather than sorting based on total crashes. But where, where you're interested in the relation between non-distracted driving and total crashes, it's even better to um, make scatter plots directly of plot the non-distracted driving cases versus total crashes, speeding alcohol versus total crashes. And that shows you then more directly the, the association between these variables, these outcomes. And I think makes it even more clear in this for the, in the case of speeding that there's sort of a group of states that have um, lower proportion of lower number of speed ascribed crashes given the the and a, and a group of states that have a higher number of speed ascribed crashes the scatter plots um, I mean, if you're interested in the relationship between variables, should make a scatter plot and not just plot the two things next to each other as sort of bar plots or those dot plots I showed. Um, I mean, the, and the, really the only disadvantage in the in the scatter plot is that it's harder to um, demonstrate the. It's harder to see the the individual labels on the states. You could add labels for certain points, um, but without a kind of interactive graph that saying, identifying the points when you hover over it, it's, it's hard to show um, the relationship between, you know, the, it's hard to show the individual state identities of the points. But it, it's so in summary, the, kind of the key principles in data visualization, show as much data as you can, avoid chart junk like gratuitous three-dimensional rendering of bars. Always consider taking logs. If you're interested in differences between things, then you may want to just show the differences directly. Put things, put the things to be compared next to each other. You know, there, there are going to be trade-offs in your design choices. Um, you, you need to make a really a value judgment about which comparisons are most important, and that should drive your 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 decisions. Use color to set things apart, but always consider colorblind folks, which is um, a, especially among males. A relatively high proportion of your viewers will be color red, green, colorblind. Um, there are some great tools now. Um, I use this tool Color Oracle for the Mac that lets you, that tries to um, demonstrate what a red, green, colorblind person might, how they might perceive your graph. And that's good for, um, I understand it's good for avoiding um, really, you know, bad color choices. In general, um, you want to use position rather than angle or area to represent quantities. That if you, um, you know, any data visualization is 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 using um, positions or 
or shapes to represent quantities in, and some of those um, choices in that encoding like position will be easier um, to compare than others. Um, easing the comparisons that you want to make is important. You want to align axes as much as you can and really use common axes limits as you can to ease those comparisons. I'm enthusiastic about putting direct labels onto graphs rather than use legends, although I admit that it, it can be a lot of manual work to get the labels in the right spots. Um, you want to avoid alphabetical order um, always. Ne never sort anything alphabetically. Instead, sort based on some meaningful variable like total number of crashes in that previous figure. Whether to use zero or not, include zero or not in access limits is um, sort of always a difficult question. And it, it, if you're using bars, you should always include zero. Um, but whether or not to include zero depends on the comparison you're making and it depends on the audience that you're, that you're targeting. Um, scatter plots are really a unique um, tool for exploring relationships between variables. And if you're thinking about relationship between variables, you should probably be making a scatter plot. So it seems like something that was has only been invented a, one or a couple of times. It's not something that comes naturally to people. Um, but really, scatter plots should be the um, kind of the key tool in your data visualization kit. The, well, this, it, my, my thoughts about data visualization have been inspired by a lot of different people, Hadley Wickham, Naomi Robbins, Howard Weiner, Andrew Gelman, Dan Carr, um, Tufty. So I just wanted to, to sort of give a little vote of thanks to those folks. Um, where I would point you first in sort of further reading about data visualization would be um, first these books by Tufty, especially the first of these, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. Um, sort of a coffee table book, um, lots of great pictures, um, very nice printing quality. Um, I would highly recommend um, taking a look at that book. He has a, a couple more books after that. I think you know, his books have become less interesting to me over time. That more, well, his later books are not as interesting to me. I, the The earliest book is the is where I would point you to first. Um, Andrew Gelman, he's a professor at Columbia. He has this great paper from years ago on turning tables into graphs of he went um, he went through an issue of the American an issue of of a statistics journal and looked at all the papers that had tables and tried to turn them into graphs um, really an interesting short read sort of the my favorite book about data visualization is this Naomi Robbins book on creating more effective graphs it's um, quite practical. It, I, it's probably focused on simpler graphs still, um, but it, it's, it's a great practical book. Um, the Nature Methods had a long series of columns on data visualization that, you know, make, have a lot of, um, a lot of these are really interesting to read. You, you may have to break through the, the, um, paywall to get to them or you know go to these through the the university library but I point you to that as um, sort of an, another resource for learning about data visualization but with that um, I'd be enthusiastic to hear what questions you might have feel free to turn on your mic or type things into chat.
not hearing any questions, I will turn off the recording.